Welcome to New Tracks Workshop. My name is Jim Kello. I'm the creator and host for New Tracks, where mentors help modelers build. Thanks so much for coming. I hope you come back often and to tell your friends about our show. These Saturday workshops are a new project for New Tracks. They've resulted from comments I've received from modelers about scratch building and Chris Blackmar's interest in producing and leading this effort. The segments are structured like the popular build along session segments on our Wednesday evening shows, except these Saturday shows are designed to show modelers how to scratch build a model. I personally believe that scratch building is one of the most creative parts of model railroading. And I think you'll agree if you try it. Here is your opportunity to work for, with some skilled modelers to learn how to do it. You will learn the steps, the skills, the techniques involved in scratch building a model in any scale you want. There are no kits to buy, only the needed scratch building supplies. The plans that will be used for the model, you can download on your computer at no cost. The show's moderator, Click Chris Blackmar, is a very talented and artistic modeler. And he and his guest will guide you through the complete scratch building process, one small step at a time. After all, that's what mentoring is all about. If you're a beginner, I hope you'll join in and experience the thrill of completing a scratch built model and being able to stand back and say, I built that. If you're a more experienced or advanced modeler, I hope you'll join in and offer your advice and knowledge to less skilled modelers and even get some fresh ideas yourself. The live shows will of course be recorded on our YouTube channel so you can refer to the information later if you need to. In addition, I hope you'll visit our website, newtracksmodeling.com and subscribe. You'll need to confirm the email that you received to verify your address. And after that, you'll receive all of the notice of our future shows, as well as the login links to attend. If you would prefer to watch the, the series on YouTube, you can do that by going to our channel, New Tracks Modeling, ring the bell and click all. Therefore, you'll get all of the notice for the start of all of our future shows on the, uh, the channel. If you can spare a little time, I hope you'll consider joining our management team to help us plan and produce any of our future shows. Please contact me at Jim Kello at NewTracksModeling.com and let's discuss your interest. So welcome to the New Tracks Workshop. I look forward to seeing your finished models and of course hearing any suggestions for future shows you may have. Now, here is Chris Blackmar to start your scratch building journey. All right, everybody, welcome to the show today. <clears throat> um, thank you for joining me. The thing that I wanted to do, first of all, is run a quick video of the modeler's prayer. Um, this is a new tradition that uh, New Tracks is kind of picking up on. Father Ron is not with us right now, so I'm going to have uh, uh, the modeler's prayer that I call it uh, on the video that we'll play right now. And Will, when you're ready. Oh God, as we express our creativity in, by creating in miniature the world around us, may we marvel at the beauty and genius which created the world and instilled in us a portion of your great knowledge and wisdom. Give success to the work of our hands, O oh God. Amen. All right. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Father Ron and uh, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're kind of light today a little bit because we have um, a couple of different shows that I'm aware of going. Um, and uh, there's a couple of uh, um, live on, on uh, 
online uh, clinics being given uh, primarily by the guys down in Australia. So we may have lost a few viewers to that. So um, it's going to be up to you guys to really step up to the plate and uh, join in and make comments, et cetera, today uh, to keep this show alive for our uh, folks out there in YouTube land. If you're out there in YouTube land, I do have a gentleman watching the comments on YouTube. So if you have a question or you'd like to make a comment, certainly feel free to type that in and uh, Rich will relay that to us and we'll try to get it answered. If we somehow miss your comment or question, uh, please check back in a couple of days because we do go back and try to answer them uh, there in the YouTube chat so that uh, um, uh, everybody has uh, answers to their questions and input. And with that, I've got two other brief announcements that I'd like to do. First of all, um, I wanted to remind everybody that we're coming up on the end of the month. And if you're interested in trying to get some of those soft pastels that you normally cannot pick up from some of the um, regular houses like Dick Blick and uh, uh, Jerry's Artorama, those art houses, um, uh, we do have a deal worked out with Dakota Arts. Dakota Arts is a soft pastel specialty store. They cater specifically to uh, uh, pastelist or pastel artist. Uh, and again, <clears throat> uh, you can get a lot of different pastels in the different hardnesses and different grades that you cannot pick up from the um, regular big box art stores. So uh, it might be uh, worth your time to take a few moments and grab yourself uh, half a dozen pastels or something just to try them out and experiment and see what you can come up with. The other uh, announcement that I, oh, let me go back and finish that announcement on the pastels. Um, that uh, our discount for that ends on the 30th of this month uh, and it's Railroad 10. Railroad 10 um, is the discount code, and that'll give you 10% off. And um, it's only a one time per person usage here. So, with that, let me get on to the second announcement. And that is the thing that uh, some of you guys have been waiting to hear. Uh, Heath. Um, is in the process of doing the last couple of prints of the O scale ice house machine that he uh, has uh, drawn and uh, in CAD. And then uh, he is printing those up for us so that those of you that have requested a copy of that ice machine, um, I've Got a, a few of you and I'll try to send out an email here, but I'm hoping that uh, by this time next week, um, we'll get that off uh, to you. Um, so I need to get your email or excuse me, your mailing addresses. So if you've ordered one, uh, please uh, send that to me. If you will recall, what we're doing is having Heath send them down in bulk to us. Uh, to save on shipping costs coming across the Canadian border. And then once I get them, I will redistribute them. Um, and I do have everybody's email that I think ordered, but uh, it's been some time. And uh, quite frankly, I don't want to miss somebody. So if you requested one, please, please send me a email with your mailing address so that I can get that off to you. Um, we may be in the same boat next week because uh, Heath right now was waiting for some uh, printer resin to come in to uh, get the last uh, O scale print made up. And um, so as soon as that gets done cooking, he will get those things off to us. So they're on the way, guys. Um, Ask a question? Shoot. Well, the Canadians, it doesn't make sense to send them down to you, then have to put them send them back up across the border again. 
Uh, the Canadian ones, he's going to mail out directly from up okay. there. Um, so again, send me your email address and uh, I'll make sure he's got those. Okay. Or excuse me, not email, but your mailing address. I'm sorry. Uh, send me your mailing address so that I can make sure he's he's got all of the Canadian folks up there. Um, I think there's two of you guys up there. Um, and again, he um, I did talk to him about um, uh, making a donation to him for his time and his uh, uh, energies on this. And he's looking at it as a uh, service to the community here. And for those folks that are on this, and he's not uh, uh, even going to provide me with like a PayPal account or something so we can make our own donations. They're all just gratis. So um, I don't know how we're going to thank him on that other than uh, publicly acknowledging his uh, uh, efforts in uh, supporting the show here. So anyway, uh, send me your mailing address and I'll get everything taken care of, and that's on the way. Uh, finally, with that, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to kind of break the ice today and uh, uh, make sure that I've got all of you guys included and uh, everybody's comfortable speaking up because we're going to be doing a fine, few fine details today. Uh, and to kick it off, and instead of going around and seeing what everybody's doing today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. And I'm going to ask Neil if he wouldn't mind if I showed a couple of his uh, uh, diorama, actually a diorama that he created and a uh, couple of cars that he created and posted on the railroad line forums. Uh, Neil, would you mind if I show those? You don't know that I have these, but uh... no, I'm really I'm surprised here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, no, go um, ahead. Go okay, ahead. okay. Um, uh, Will, if you can bring up the diorama, please. Um, quite frankly, I've got to admit here publicly that I am truly humbled um, by Neil. Um, I, when I went back and looked at some of the shows, I felt that I kind of, I guess, poo-pooed, uh, although it wasn't intentional or anything, uh, some of Neil's comments. And it's like, um, I was, the, the, the reason that my, my comments were kind of like out in the air was because what Neil was saying and what he was showing to my eye, there was this huge disconnect and I was trying to reconcile all of this in my mind and um, uh, this work kind of like uh, shows you that even though Neil has been coming in and asking questions that are very very appreciative number one but his the level of the questions that he's been bringing up are at the modeler 101, maybe 102 level. I mean, he's really been outstanding in, in uh, zooming in on the, the what I call true basics of the hobby. But he's asked a few things off on the side that show that he really has an understanding of it well beyond, um, uh, you know, what he's asking. And I been fighting trying to understand where he's coming from and so i don't know if will can zoom in at all on this um but um this is a an example of a diorama and i'm assuming that it's ho scale is that correct yeah it's ho and it's a scratch it's scratch built except for the truck okay okay and um, it's really, really interesting work and things. Uh, I wanted to point out the trees and stuff. Those all look like a, uh, what's called the Caspia tree. It's uh, the, like the tree on the very right uh, where you actually take a bit of Caspia, drill a hole in the trunk, insert it, and then use the ground foam on top. Um, well, let me, yeah, let me, if you, if you have a minute, let me explain how I got the trees. Um, you're right. It's, it's a balsa trunk. And I, I went to, um, we have a Joann's around here, you know, one of the craft shops. And 
they off they they have a heck of a lot of plastic ferns that they have for sale for for you know uh, it's plastic and it stays forever. All you do is take the dust off it. So a couple of years ago, I bought a some things that just fit the fit the the, the number for what I wanted to do. And um, I've been back to the store many times and they don't carry it anymore. <laughs> so I had enough to, it, it fits exactly the scale. You just cut it out with a pair of uh, nail clippers and that's it. And then you put the foam on it. Uh, but it, it just goes to show you in our hobby, when you see something, buy it. Don't put it off because it's going to disappear real fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, and can we go to uh, his next next photo? Yeah, excuse me. I, I, there's other cars in the uh, there are other cars in the diorama as well. I forgot to mention. Obviously, those are uh, you know those are kids too. Yeah, and and uh, he's not only a structure builder. He is uh, uh, a modeler, and I believe these were out of a contest room. No. No. Nope. Okay. I, uh, I, I, you know, I was interested when I first got into modeling, I was interested in, uh, you know, the lumber industry. Um, so what I did for these two, I, I looked up on the internet and what I found was the Kinsey, uh, there's two brothers, the Kinsey brothers who did all of the uh, lumbering pictures. And I just studied them and I built these. It's, it's, um, one of the things, I got to say, this was the most enjoyable project I ever built. I, I just really, one of those things that you get more energized as you're going through it. And I wanted to point out, and I think they still sell them, I'm not sure. But the uh, equipment inside, the, uh, the boilers and the winches, that's from uh, Bachman. Huh. And uh, they were very reasonable. You get two for twenty bucks. Wow! So those are those aren't eighty ninety dollar uh, 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 castings. They're from Bachman. Huh? Interesting. Okay. Well, does anybody have any questions on these two dioramas for Neil before we uh, get off on this? All right. Well, um, it answers a whole lot of questions, and I have been. Truly humbled. Uh, I say that from the bottom of my heart, sir, a tip of the hat, outstanding modeling. And thank you so much for sharing your information with us here and uh, for participating. You've really helped nail the uh, beginning leveler, beginning level modeler and uh, trying to zoom in on some of the things that they um, need to go through. With that, I'm going to move my uh, computer. Uh, Chris? Yeah. I got a gentleman on YouTube. His name is Joe Gil Martin, and he wants to know if the ice machines are still available. Um, if he will, um, I think I've got one extra uh, HO scale coming down. But if he will email me, um, and you can give him my email, Rich. I can't uh, do that. You'll have to. You'll have to say uh, if Ken is oh, listening. That's right. That's Ken right. Can type, Ken can type it in. Okay. Well, uh, Ken, um, let me just say it's, uh, well, <laughs> however you want to do it. But if he will uh, go to the New Tracks website and underneath our page, uh, the this, uh, workshop page, at the top there, it has my email address. If you will send me an email, um, if I've still got a uh, available uh, one, uh, I will send it to you. And again, I do need to know the scale. I think I've got an extra one in HO, um, but I, I've got to see. I'm not sure what Heath is going to send me absolutely. Uh, and um, we'll see what's going on on that. But we'll try to help you out. Um, I believe that the footprint on that is about two inches or so, uh, about 20 foot long. Uh, Rich, you may have a, a better clue on that. Joe is on with us. I huh? think it's uh, shorter than that. I think it was uh, 
13 HO scale feet long and eight feet wide. Okay, okay. Anyway, um, I know that Rich was kind of working with him. Um, so uh, let's see here. And Will, if you can spotlight my desktop for me, please. We're gonna get into some modeling. And as I'm modeling guys, again, um, we're going to ask that you guys give us your input on some of this stuff. And I'm trying to get everything. Thought I had it set up, but, and I went and bumped it in. Um, chink, chink. Oh, up a little bit. Yeah. Well, it's, again, I'm fighting that back. Right there. Stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm still trying to get us past uh, this stage right here. Um, and um, this is uh, what I'm building right now is, is this piece right here. And this is done through edge gluing. And for those of you that are kind of new to modeling, I wanted to kind of review edge gluing real quick. Um, some of the tricks to edge gluing, um, it's one of the toughest types of clean gluing that you're going to face when you're, you're doing some modeling and getting a reasonable joint um, in this thing. So um, I'm using, uh, this is a two by 10, as I recall, and HO scale. And I've got two of them. And I'm going to put them together to make a uh, kind of an L or a, a square. Now, when you're going through an edge gluing uh, on something like this, the trick to make it look a little bit cleaner is to try to hide that uh, edge. And so you want one of them you have to put up over the edge of the other one. So here, what you want to do is instead of coming in and having this one, uh, which will be the face, because I'm going to go like this. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to get this back in view here. There we go. Um, so you're going to want to hide this edge right here. Um, if, if you can, um, so that it, it that's the edge that's going to be, shall I say, exposed. I shouldn't say hide. I used the wrong term there. Um, but that's that's the edge that's going to hide that seam the best. Because if I have it with this one on the top, then you're going to see this leading edge here. So by putting it this way, I'm hiding that seam the best I can because this top edge will be pointing up vertically and is less likely to be seen when viewing face on um, or if you're taking a photograph of the thing. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I'm just going to use my typical glue bin and I'm going to use the typical, uh, today I'm using the Eileen's Tacky. So um, I'm just going to throw some in on my uh, glue bin and move forward here. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts about hiding that seam? Okay, uh, I'm going to go forward then. And what I'm going to do here, go. You can make, you can, the, the, the board that you're using is about the same thickness as index card. You can use a paper texture and do twi uh, two boards and then just fold it. And then you won't have to glue around the corner and you have a large area to glue with. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, it's a different, different material and you can use that material. Um, it's just that uh, here I'm kind of using the wood and uh, we're just going forward, but yeah, outstanding idea. 
And don't be afraid to make use of different materials when you're going through this. And if you'll notice here, what I'm doing is I'm kind of dabbing it and kind of rolling it. And then if you take your toothpick and you put it along the edge here, you can kind of slide it a little bit and that'll put a thin film here. And then you can just take it and glue it to the seam. And I'm going to use a, uh, try to turn this around here so that you guys can see it a little bit. Uh, take a square of some sort and put it up and tap her down and get her going. And then I'm also going to use a, a block, another block here, just to make sure that I've got everything square. So and from the opposite side. And the Eileen's tacky and it is kind of tacking down on this. And, and so uh, that will work. And there I've got this thing. I'm going to just put it aside for a few moments here and allow it to kind of dry. And then I'm going to move on to the next phase as that's drying. So we have uh, made this at this point. So now I've got the door. But if you will recall, I also needed to uh, do some other framing on the door. I need to add my interior framing, my base plate, and um, then I also need to do the, um, I think I need to do the Z in the door. Is I, nope, I don't, we did that. So at this point, uh, I did part of, part of the Z. So I gotta come back and do the other part of the Z. And then we gotta add the door handle real quick. So that's kind of where we're at. We're trying to finish this up and, and get her mounted. So if you will recall, I uh, put this, bracing on the back and I gave myself some spacing uh, so that when I take my door and put it into place, uh, it will actually kind of fall in, into a quasi open position. So uh, that's what we're shooting for at this point in time. But we also need to add some um, framing around this hole here. So uh, I'm going to grab that uh, large two by 10 or something again. And I know I've got some pieces up here somewhere. And I lost it. Okay. That poison. Well, I'm going to use. Okay, let's go with this. Um, <clears throat> Because I'm hiding most of my door, I'm not super concerned about the thickness of my wall. If I was doing something where I could see through it, I would be a little bit more cognizant of it. The trick here is to uh, make sure to follow kind of prototypical practices. So you want to put in your top first, uh, then uh, do your sides. So we'll go on ahead and cut this thing first to, to match. I'm going to move my glue off to the side. I'm going to get my X-Acto knife and I'm going to make a uh, quick square cut on this. Now, normally I would use a chopper. I'll be up front with you guys, but seeing how um, I'm trying to do this for the folks that, um, don't have all of the fancy tools. I'm just going to use uh, the end here and come on. Put that in here and then pick that up and going to come across. And 
then I'm going to score it. And the trick here is to lay your blade up against the edge of the uh, uh, opening here, and then use that as a guide, and then just kind of rotate up. You got to make sure not to cut your clapboard up above it. Score it to give you kind of a score mark. And then you can score that thing. And I don't know if my head is in the way or not. You're OK, Chris. OK. Thank you. Um, so that takes care of that one. Now, when I put this on, I want to make it flush. So what I'm going to do is just, uh, first of all, check my fit. Uh, for me, it's close enough for government work. It's a little bit shy. I cannot quite fit uh, the, thick, the thickness of a X-Acto knife blade there, but it's, it's close for government work. So I'm going to stab that thing and put some glue on the back side of it. And um, then we'll go on ahead and put it on. And again, you want to always get a thin film of glue. No big blotches. Uh, blotches are going to pop out. Put it down in there and um, kind of squeeze it into position. And by having it Right there, it's going to be in the correct position. I use my tweezers a whole lot. I, I work a lot with tweezers. Uh, I spent 10 years inside the medical field and uh, I worked a lot with tweezers. So um, over that time frame, um, old EMT and stuff. So quite used to them. And, um, you know, normally, if you had the ability, you could take some clamps, uh, like a little bar clamp uh, or something. Mm -hmm. I have brass bar clamps. I'm not going to show them right now. But if you had a clamp that you could clamp this thing on, that would even be better. And um, But for our purposes, I'm just going to move forward with this. The next thing is uh, the sides. So I've got a straight line from where I made my cut already, a reasonably straight. So I'm just going to utilize that. And I'm going to come in here. Now, I need to think about this one for just a brief moment. Do I want to uh, weather this piece of wood in this joint or not? Because I'm hiding it with the door and stuff, I'm not going to worry about it. But if I was doing a pl place where it's not really uh, gonna be covered and I want it to be really kind of warm, I would do some lid staining. And I'm gonna cover the lid staining here a little bit more in just a couple of minutes. And we're gonna take a look at the effects that one can achieve with that in more detail. So I'm gonna put this puppy up against this and I'm gonna use my, um, Drive and score technique again. <coughs> this is my technique. I don't know, guys, uh, short of uh, using calipers or something, um, which would be another way of doing this. Do you guys have any other methods that you typically utilize? You're blocking the view with your head, uh, Chris. Sorry. Just That's move it up over your X. Thank you, Pat, because I can't see. Oh, okay. Um, so if I wanted to weather it, now would be the time to weather it, but I'm not going to a whole lot. I'm just going to stick some glue on this puppy and get her installed. Uh, and I guess on the next one, I'll just 
show real quick. Uh, maybe not. If I got my calipers handy, yeah, I did have one. One set. Got a set of dividers that we can utilize. Try to give people a alternative method. And this is why you always check your cuts before you try to go through and add something. Don't make assumptions that your cuts are going to be good because they're not always good. Oh, the joys of monitoring. Nice looking hair there, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> like bald head. <laughs> the problem is, I'll be upfront with you guys, is that um, with the lens that I have in my optivisor. Uh, because I'm blind as a bat, um, without getting my head down here fairly close because of the focal distance of the optivisor, it's tough to keep my head out of the way and keeping my head out of the way, I literally cannot see the, the workspace. So again, I'm putting this in here this way and using my thing. And I do have a little space on this corner, but again, I'm not gonna sweat it because the door is gonna cover it up. So, hey, Chris. Yes. The gentleman that wanted that old scale ice machine is on the video right now so i sent him a personal message to email you okay okay thank you um rich yes sir can you go on ahead he you said that the gentleman wanted it in o scale yes i already texted heath to let him know Okay, yeah. Let Heath know to add one extra O scale, please. And okay. everybody that may delay our stuff a day or two, again, Heath, I know, was waiting for some printer resin. So, but um, I'll keep everybody advised, but please make sure to send me your mailing addresses because we're trying to get these things out. Uh, another way to do this is to cut from the back like this and what you can do is I don't know if you guys can see it here what I've done is I've just placed it and then I'm taking and using the uh, edge this edge right here as my um, guide if you will and I'm just coming up laying the heel of the knife and everything along that edge and then making my score mark and then I'll make the cut. And let's double check it for the change of pace. And wouldn't you know, I made her too long. Yeah, typical government work. Yeah. All right, and I'm gonna have to force this one to fit a little bit, but we'll make her work. It's always fun to try to remember that I need to try to move stuff over in front of the camera. 
question. You, after building models for 40 years, and you guys, I'm sure, can relate, you don't typically think about where I'm holding stuff in front of me to be able to apply glue, etc. Make sure my edge is clean. And we're going to just drop her in. Okay, looks okay from the front side. If you will recall way back when, um, when we were doing some painting at the back, back side of this thing, um, I got a bunch of paint on the front side here. And I told you not to worry about it, that it would dis disappear as we were moving forward. And now you can kind of see that we're getting rid of some of that stuff. Okay, and then I'm just going to take my uh, angle plate here and put it on top. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm just trying to make sure that I don't have any of those things sticking out. Again, I've got the clapboards here, and it's going to be, you know, even with the top of the clapboard edge, but, you know, so be it. All right, so that kind of takes us forward on that. I'm going to put that one aside for a moment, and I'm going to grab this. All right. Uh, before I leave this, by the way, um, any questions on this? You guys, I'm disappointed. How about my foot plate? I didn't add that. Um, I need to add that. Um, so we'll grab, and this is a dirtier piece of wood because it'd be well worn. So well, I think they call that the sill plate. Sill plate. Thank you. I think I called it a foot plate, but you're absolutely right. <clears throat> and you guys probably cannot see, but I've actually got a little tiny space underneath where I cut. And so I'm showing three different ways to kind of bring this up. Um, this one's a little dangerous to do it that way, but you can do it. Um, it's harder. Well, and the problem with doing it that way is you don't have this thing glued in there tight. It's going to come loose what Marine runs into when she's trying to do her bridges. We can only see her head. Sorry about that. Uh, all I'm doing is trying to get this uh, trim work back in place. I'm going to come in from behind. Chris? Yes. I found another tool other than an X-Acto knife is the uh, sprue cutter. Worked quickly and easily to cut that stuff. Yeah, and you can use also um, yeah. on, on some soft things, some of these tools too. But yes, a sprue cutter would also work. I do not have the tweezer type sprue cutters. Uh, unfortunately, but uh, those are the ones that I use to cut sprues. But uh, uh, there's another one that's a, a tweezer type that's actually a, a pretty good tool. I just don't utilize it. Um, do you have any any uh, preference? Uh, you use the plier or the tweezer type? More the plier type. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I can put this in uh, in there so it's going to fit. And I'm going to run this across. You guys probably cannot see it at this point. But my glue is starting to dry and it's got that film. So all I'm doing here is I'm 
uh, going underneath and just grabbing a little bit of fresh glue out of that daub and putting it on top. Eileen's Tacky is a clumpy type of glue. Um, for those of you that don't use it or haven't used it, but when you apply it and then you kind of stretch it out uh, to make a film, uh, it turns into a real nice film. So, and then as I've discussed, when I get enough paper or uh, toothpicks, I just move on to the next uh, business card. Okay, and I'm going to put this in here. Voila, come on. Just get it on there. Sorry, guys. And quite frankly, on the other side, I used a, a bigger piece of uh, silk plate than what I used here. But um, the door is a little bit wider than this side. So I'm just not going to worry about it. And again, it's going to be hidden by the dock anyway. So, um, but you do need to still have it there because it is going to show. All right. Now, we've got that done. Any questions on that frame? Come on, guys. Uh, okay, next stop. Uh, Will, hey, Chris, Frank, shoot. When, when you're working, can you put your uh, object you're working on either at or just above the X? Okay, like right there? Yeah, that's, that's good. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see here. All right. Um, yeah, with the computer up above my head and I have to literally stop and look up and move back to see around the camera. Um, it's kind of one of those things that I don't do. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I've added this and I'm gonna add the second uh, Z bracing if you, or, uh, cross bracing here. Um, and what happened to my other piece of wood? I'll wrap with you. So I'm going to have to color a piece of wood real quick here, it looks like. So I'm just going to grab my pastel chalk. And this is a Terry Ludwig chalk. I'm pretty sure it's just an off white. And I'm just going to add it to it this way. And add it to it this way. And call it good. And then I'm going to just uh, grab a little bit of weathering mix. And cheap number two, dab, unload, paint using a stippling method to set the thing a little of bit. Of the X, Chris. Sorry. Good call. <laughs> Thank you guys for keeping me honest. <laughs> All right. And then we'll put this back. And now bring this down. And first thing is, is my angle here. And then coming up. Up with an angle, uh, and you have to re remember that you're going to want to get it right there at that corner. So make sure you're at about the center. Okay. 
at the corner. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this edge right here to mark my score score line. And put that into place. And there we've got that one in place. I've already got the angle cut so I can uh, add the next one. It goes down here at the bottom corner and it comes up. Right there. And so now we've got this ready to install. Now, I'm going to digress for just a moment here and talk about this thing that I call lid staining that you guys keep talking about or hearing me talk about. Um, there's a couple of different ways that I can approach this. Um, number one, I cut these edges and I'm definitely going to want to stain them. But the question is, how weathered do I want them to be? This is getting into some very fine nuances uh, particularly in HO scale. N scalers, you're probably not going to care ding bad about this. O scalers, it's definitely something you want to pay attention to. If you're creating a diorama or a contest quality or a heavy foreground model, something that you want to draw uh, some attention to, it's in an area that you want to bring it, attention to on the model. This is a, something you need to consider. So what I can do here is I can go through and I can, um, what I call lid stain, which gives me more control over the uh, wicking process. But prior to edge staining that, I need to determine if I want to do any wire brushing. Virtually every, model I build, every cut on every inboard, I do a little bit of a brushing on. Um, this is something new to me. So uh, as far as not doing it, but I'm not doing it on this model um, because it's kind of an introductory model. But uh, I wanted to bring this up and, and show people the different effect. And it's, it's a 29 cent deal. Once you get your cut done, just do a couple of uh, quick uh, little brush strokes. And I'm applying, oh, I don't know, you know, some real, you can see that the brush is slightly moving down and I've got it up against my wrist. So I'm, I'm applying a fair amount of pressure on it. And I just go through and kind of scrape that a little bit or brush it a little bit. And what that does is that adds more texture and grain to the ends of the wood. Why is that important? Uh, Will, if you can bring up my shack, please. And we'll discuss this. Okay, uh, and Will, if you can uh, kind of move in a little bit. This is an O scale shack that I built, but I'm using the pictures from the O scale because it kind of really shows. If we look at the corner uh, where the framing is around the door opening here, you can see that that board that's kind of lining the vertical side going down that one has the end stain, but it really doesn't have much wicking going up on it. The same thing with the board, the header board going across the top. Uh, the edges are, the, it's been stained with just a straight, I've cut the board, 
and then I lid stained it. And so it's been stained. And quite frankly, these were done with a rolling technique of the furrow to control the uh, application of stain and really limit it. Uh, so that just cut the, it just colored the end or that cut edge. But my point is, is that you can color those edges and um, not really have it wick across. Now, if we go over about uh, three boards, four boards, and down just a little bit, yeah, there you can see next to the knot hole uh, on that board and also on the other board that have both been cut vertically, or excuse me, horizontally, um, you can see where the edge staining and brushing actually allows the stain to wick up. So the board on the furthest right is just edge, edge stain. Uh, using the lid technique, the other two boards that you see here have been brushed and then edge stained uh, using the same lid staining technique. So you can kind of see the difference here that that little brushing that I just did will add to the boards. Again, something very, very subtle, but if you're into fine model building, it is a technique. So let's get into the edge staining if you wanna come back to my desktop. Does anybody have any questions, by the way, on uh, the effects or what you can see with the edge staining or lid staining of those edges and the difference between the brushing? Uh, again, you need a small fine wire brush uh, and I use a stainless steel or a brass bristled brush and uh, that, that will work for that. So edge staining, uh, I do that through what I call a lid staining technique. So all you do is shake your stain, open up your lid and you've got enough stain in the lid that if you tilt it, you'll get the stain down in, in the thing. Just take your uh, piece, stick it in there, wipe it down, or just squeeze it. And I don't, I doubt that my camera can provide the resolution for you to see it, but I am getting some staining with a, a bit of wicking there. Um, hopefully you can see that, I don't know. Nope. Yeah. Let's see here. Ching, 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 ching. I've never mastered this yet. Where is it? That's my fingers. Well, rat poison. Where am I here? I'm sorry, folks, trying to get this to. The show is really, where's my camera? There we go. Everything's 180 degrees off. And it's just, I don't have a regular lens to really work with here because I'm using a camera and it's tough. But, and the camera resolution isn't gonna work. Well, we tried, uh, I apologize. But trust me, there is a little bit of uh, uh, wicking going on on these two pieces. And I'm just gonna do the other piece one more time a little bit. So has anybody ever used uh, a technique like this or a similar um, some other technique to obtain similar type of uh, weathering techniques. Can't believe you guys are so quiet. Okay. Out there. I I use a brush sometimes from the end, and uh, it wiped out and just let it wick up. And if I want okay. to control the wicking a little more, I pre-wet the the piece of wood with alcohol. Okay, 
So okay. it's not, it won't wick as aggressively. I, I can control it. I can let it dry out in a few minutes. And then if I need to apply a little more, that's just the way I try to control it. Okay. It's hit and miss. You know, really, it's just what you're doing right now. You just keep building it up and building it up. You get too much, can't go back, but you can always add a little more. Yeah, yeah. And that's the whole right there. That is the, the real bottom line trick to weathering is layers, layers on layers. Yeah, you're not going to use two, maybe three steps and get a good weathering technique um, or good weathering effects. It's going to take multiple attempts and uh, just accept that as a fact of life and move forward with it and enjoy the process and uh, teach yourself different ways to sneak up on the final effect that you're after. Uh, with the modelers that we have on here, the different effects that they achieve through the, uh, the layering techniques will be a, a astounding on uh, what they can uh, come up with. Okay, so now we're gonna go on ahead and add these things to the board. Will, how am I doing on time? You're we're at the top of the hour. At the top of the hour, okay. Well, um, I'm gonna go on ahead and add these things. I'm gonna let Will go on ahead and run the uh, O and S scale magazine uh, resource. Um, those guys kind of help uh, us out. And so we're going to do a quick ad for them as I'm adding this. Notice that I'm just putting the glue on the back side of this. I'm not going to put any on the ends. Um, I'm hoping that the door, because this is a static model, that this will be enough. And Will, I'm going to let you go on ahead and run that video, please. Welcome to the world of scale, O and S railroading. We are your resource for all O and S scale modeling. Both our magazines are advertiser supported and free to read online, download as a PDF, or even print. All advertisers are hot linked to their website so if you see something you like, just click. Please check out our websites for the current issues. All back issues available free for the O-Scale resource and the S-Scale resource magazines. And, if you are a manufacturer, distributor, or retail establishment, Please contact us through our website for advertising opportunities. There you go. All right. Thank you. And, you know, um, this is not supposed to be about watch Chris build. So uh, I'm going to bring in uh, a cardstock modeler for just a few moments here and have him uh, briefly show uh, what he's got going with some cardstock and uh, Paul if you want to introduce him real quick feel free to do so and I'm going to shut up. This is a model of a gas station that will be available for download on the new track site shortly. Uh, Dave Rarig is doing a test build right now and you'll be able to follow along with Dave Rarig and Father Ron as to how to build the model. Uh, uh, Dave has already found a few mistakes in the model, and if need be, I will redesign it. But for now, I'm going to turn you over to Dave and let him show you what he's got. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, I started putting this together. I'm not sure if I'm on the screen or not. You are. There we go. All right. Um, this is a model right here that 
Paul is talking about. He published some uh, drawings of this uh, and they're available for download from uh, new tracks. It's a card model. And I started a construction, got quite a bit of it actually finished. Here's the, uh, here's the other side. Uh, I chose to model it with the door closed here. Uh, he's included both a, an open door and a closed door on the drawings. I decided to make it with a closed door. One thing that I did do that is not all that typical in my card modeling is I made the uh, clear windows. You might notice this. Uh, see my finger inside of there. We lost the video or the uh, audio. Okay. There I'm you go. Sure. I'm not sure why that muted. I had it unmuted, but this was the uh, drawing part of it because I cut a piece out. Uh, it actually starts out, the windows are, are black, printed black. Now you can leave it that way. A lot of times when I build a card model, I will just put uh, clear cellophane tape over top of the uh, window to make it look like glass. And then uh, sandwich that between another layer of card so that the uh, surrounding uh, area around the window is, is not the glossy cellophane. But on this model, I thought I'd try a different approach. Uh, I actually cut the windows out of, of the print and tried a, a technique which I've known about for a while, but I never really tried before. So this is my first attempt at it. What you do is you print the drawing, this drawing here, you print it onto a pressure uh, sensitive label stock. Uh, of course, you gotta have the right size label stock. I bought some eight and a half by 11 full sheet so that I could print the whole thing. And then you go by and you cut out the black. Now here's, here's the trick. You don't try to remove a label stock and then put it over a piece of clear plastic or glass. You leave every, everything together. You take the whole label, stick it on the glass, and then you take a scalpel or an X-Acto knife, and you cut where the muttons and the frame lines are, right when it's sitting on the glass, on the plastic, okay? That allows you to cut down along the very narrow lines, and cut right straight across. So you're not trying to cut just to the inside of each of these window panes. I'm actually cutting right straight across and down. Uh, makes it a whole lot easier because <laughs> you're just taking your, your uh, scalpel and you're going right straight across uh, using a straight edge and allows you to make a nice straight thin line for your window frames. And when that's all cut, you come back with your X-Acto and peel off that uh, label in the area that's going to be windows. Now I'm gonna try something here because I have some photos that I took. Uh, so maybe I can share my screen. I'm going to try this anyway. Uh, I took some pictures. I find the right one here. OK. 
Okay. Is this coming through all right? Yes. Okay. This was the print that I made of the drawing. So you've got two pages showing the wall and this is the roofing right here. All right. Here's where I started the side, but this is a little bit out of order. So let me see if I can get back to, okay, here's a window. Here you can see how I took a label stock and I just stuck that on a piece of, uh, in this case, uh, 5 thousandths clear styrene plastic. Would have been better a little bit thicker, but 5 thousandths is what I had, so that's what I used. Uh, here you can see a problem I had. The label is so sticky <laughs> that it, when you try to peel it off, it leaves a, a residue of glue and little bits of paper stuck onto the uh, glass. Over on this side, this is where I haven't peeled it off yet. This is still the black paper, uh, black print, if you will, on the sticky label. And I just peel it off from the very edge and peel the whole piece off. That leaves these very narrow strips undisturbed. Now, the problem is with this residue is you have to come back and clean it. I use just a, a Q-tip swab and put some uh, mineral spirits on it. It takes that glue right off, cleans them right up. You can see here where the mineral spirit actually penetrated into the paper and made it wet, but eventually that dries and, and you don't see it in the finished product. Uh, these are actually overlays that I cut. Just plain cardstock paper goes over top. And here's the, uh, this is a frame, framing around. Now, Chris, you are struggling with cutting little pieces of wood. <laughs> this is paper and it's uh, to me much easier because you just cut the whole thing out and then glue it in place around the window frame. I'm starting to assemble it. Assemble it. So, okay. Are there any uh, questions on that part of it? Oops. I'm going to get rid of this. I don't need this. Ah, there we go. Okay. All right, anybody have any questions on what I did there so far? Uh, like I said, this is new technique for me. I haven't tried it before. Uh, I'm debating it might, might have worked a little bit better <clears throat> had I used a, uh, a removable label stock rather than a permanent label. Uh, concern there is that it's not near as sticky and it might eventually peel off. Whereas a permanent label, I'm sure is is stuck. <laughs> it's going to stay. So anyway, this is the building. Like I said, I uh, don't have the roof on it yet. See the interior. I actually uh, reinforced it with some chipboard card. So it's quite a bit thicker than just a single layer of card stock. And I slapped some, uh, actually this is artist acrylic paint. I painted the inside because my intention is to put lighting in here and that acts as a block to keep the light from uh, glowing through the paper. I don't think it would anyway, because I reinforced it with a card with uh, chipboard. But if you had just one layer of cardstock, uh, the light would definitely glow through, through the uh, cardstock. And by painting it on the inside, that eliminates that possibility. Those labeling, that labeling material, it's eight, eight by 10 sheets or something like that. Uh, eight, eight and a half by 11. It's a full yeah. sheet. So um, could, 
you photo when you printed it, you printed the whole side of the building, didn't you? Like all That's one correct. Time. So you could basically take that and adhere it to a, a heavier material. Oh yeah. yeah. In fact, I have a, a model with, uh, I had previously done that, but I, I didn't actually finish it. I never took the, uh, never took beyond just printing it on the label stock. Uh, but yeah, you could do that same thing. I I'm thought not was sure it how it would work because there you're dealing with a, a large sheet that you're trying to get you know, position just right and everything before you stick it down. Because once it's stuck down, it's it's down. You can't get it off. Yeah, I guess if it, if it overlapped the material they were gluing to, then you could, uh, you know, trim it up, the back piece. I'm thinking of something yeah. heavier and stronger than what you can put to cardstock through a printer, just if you're building a larger structure. Yeah. But, um, this would be well, the way I generally reinforce my cardstock is, is I'll just print uh, on my printer the standard card. And then I uh, layer it over top of a heavier material. Sometimes even just do two layers of cardstock together. And I use a uh, stick, kids stick glue, you know, the, the uh, I have some of it, I think, in my drawer. Yeah. I just use this Elmer, Elmer's yeah. uh, stick glue. Uh, put a pretty heavy layer on, on the backing piece. If you're using like a piece of chipboard or something as a backing, put a heavy layer onto that. That prevents the cardstock from curling up so much. Because if you try to put it on your thinner paper on a cardstock, it'll, uh, it'll make that paper curl. What was attracting me was some of the signs too. So I used that material to print a sheet of signs. Now I got self self sticking signs when I cut them out. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank Same you. thing. Although what I found is that the label stock, uh, maybe you could find some. I don't know, but the label stock I got does not print as nicely as even the uh, card stock does. The thing with printing with a computer, with, with a inkjet, is that if your paper isn't real white or real smooth, you don't get a nice, sharp uh, print. And you don't get good color either. The, uh, I can zoom in us. These signs on this building probably can't pick up the difference. But on the front, that's just plain cardstock. Here on, this, here on the side, what I did is I printed that whole side again onto a uh, premium presentation paper, which is a coated uh, finish, and it brings out the color. It looks very nice and bright red. You can see that. If you look on the front, it's not as bright. The color is even off a little bit. Or you can pick it up if I show it on the on the corner. The color on on this front here is different than the color on this side. Fine. That's because the one on the side is printed on the presentation paper, and then I just use a stick glue to laminate that onto a piece of plain cardstock, cut the whole thing out, and then glued that onto the side of the building. Those two things makes a nice bright sign. It also sets it out a little bit from the surface. So you can't tell it here, but you could actually run your finger across it and you could feel that sign. Uh, it's more like if, if it was a sign that was hung on the side of the building rather than something that was painted on to the side or you know printed on the yes. side. Yeah. I think we like to go sometimes, but, but you know, if you get the pre-made signs, it's, uh, we usually, if you're working with wood, you use this tissue paper and then it can set down in all the grooves on the, on the wood. Yeah. But if uh, you're getting the signage from whatever company, Texaco or something, they supply the signs. I imagine they're, they're a hard panel sign, probably, uh, well, even the ones they used to make in porcelain. But, uh, yeah, and I was thinking about that. Um, you can use something like a, a Mod Podge or something 
over that uh, printed sign and uh, put on a, a couple of clear coats. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll be discussing that with uh, the signage for this. And uh, uh, that will give you that uh, reflective uh, surface that you get with the porcelain signs. There's something else that'll work for that, Chris, uh, that I use is uh, spray uh, in a spray can, you know, paint. But either you use a gloss finish or, or uh, what, I, what I like is uh, a shellac. Yeah. A spray shellac in a can. Yeah. Uh, that actually, if you put about two or three coats on, that'll bring the surface right up and it'll, it'll look nice. It'll look lot, almost like a metal sign, you know, like these yeah. old time metal signs. Right. Uh, and then you cut that sign out of your paper that you printed it on and then you can use that uh, for your signage. I concur. I like, the, I like the character of the structure itself. It doesn't look cartoonish like some uh, models that are produced and um, it looks like something you see at the side of the road. In fact, it reminds me of when I was a kid, uh, a friend had a structure much like that, his father. And after it was closed at night, I used to be able to work on my cars in the bay on the side of the building. And that's, that's, that's what it reminds me of. It looks so real. Run it right in there. <laughs> yep. Yep. One thing I did notice, though, uh, this building is kind of small. Uh, you know, so I, I put the uh, lavatories, I actually put walls around inside of there. And then I measured the distance from the wall over here to the back. Now, I probably could have made the lavatories a little smaller. I think they're uh, eight feet by nine feet in HO scale. And that only left like 18 feet from the door to the back wall here. So that's kind of tight for a modern car. It would have worked though for 1920s because they uh, were. Really that's exactly what I was thinking that the, the 1920s, 30s cars got a little larger, but. When you got to the 70s and those structures are still around so you got one of those big boats from the 70s trying to get it in there you were squeezing around the car well you have to work with the door open yeah. <laughs> let, let the car get out the back <laughs> well that's a beautiful model and uh thank you for sharing that and that's a great preview on what you're going to be uh showing us on the wednesday night show here so thank you uh, um, any final questions or anything coming in from youtube on that yeah, uh, our Ken uh, asked, uh, he said he still couldn't understand David's label stock technique and wants to know if he would consider doing a recorded video to show on another day. Would that be something you'd be interested in, David? Yeah, actually, I think I'm going to go into more detail on that when I do the build along okay. uh, on, the other, on the other show. I know, in fact, that's something that Paul mentioned. It might be worthwhile doing a 15 minute uh, segment just on using a printed label stock like that to make windows. Yeah, I think it would be very valuable because I picked up a big tip here on using a high quality uh, presentation paper uh, in the inkjet to get a uh, better quality uh, colored signs if that's the material you're using. So I think it'd be a very valuable uh, segment to include. There, there's all kinds of uh, little tricks that you can <laughs> you can use in, in card modeling. Uh, the one thing, of course, is that you're printing these designs up yourself on your home printer. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to reprint something if it doesn't come out the way you thought it was going to. Or you can use different kinds of materials to print on. Uh, I've tried many different kinds of papers over the years. For general building, I just use 110 pound stock, uh, plain card stock that's white. But even there, you get some variation. Uh, I found a 65 pound from uh, Nina, the same company that I buy the 110 pound from, the 65 pound prints differently than the 110 pound. And, and the uh, presentation paper I use is an Epson product. Get it right out here. They have, oh, I don't know, I think I've seen three or different, three or different kinds. 
This is the uh, map presentation paper that I use for the signs. Oh, they can't pick it up here. Okay, it's Epson. Okay. It's, it's uh, Epson gives it three stars over here, okay? It's four and a half thousand thick, or 4.9, I guess it is. Eight and a half by 11 sheets. Well, they call it a 102 gram per square, square meter. So it's kind of a lightweight, but not as light as regular printing paper. Regular printing paper is usually about three to four thousandths thick. This is 4.9 thousand, so it's almost five thousandths thick. But then Epson also makes a four star uh, premium presentation paper, mat. Well, this particular product is coated on both sides of the paper. So it doesn't matter which side you feed through your printer, it's gonna look the same. Uh, the other paper is only printed on one side or only coated on one side. So you have to pay attention to which side you put through your printer because one side will print much different than the other side. Dave, uh -huh. some of those printers we have can't handle some of that heavy paper, is that right? Well, I don't think you'll have any problem whatsoever with the, the 4.9. Okay. Uh, no, the heavier you might. This one is uh, 9.8 mil mm -hmm. or 9.8 thousandths. Uh, I've never had a problem with mine. Uh, I guess I, I can probably peel this off here. Bear with me. Take my camera off my computer. You use a photo printer or you just use a regular Epson? It's just a regular Epson. This is my printer right here. Oops. Okay. Okay. I got an. I bought an eco tank because I. Those are nice. Quite a bit of uh, ink, <laughs> but surprisingly, get my pill bottles out of the way here. Uh, this tank printer, uh, you can see my ink levels right there. Mm -hmm. uh, that is about I don't know eight or nine months worth of printing. Yeah. Okay. And I, I mean, mine last long. Mine. I I print. A lot of paper, a lot of pages. And my previous printer was an Epson. They use cartridges. And I the last time ran out of ink, I had to replace all three, all four cartridges. And they're not and cheap. Like a, like a hundred bucks. Yeah. So I said, man, I can make a change about this now. <laughs> uh now, and they would last me. Oh, I don't even know anymore, but it seemed like I was changing cartridges like all the time. Mm -hmm. So I bought this eco tank printer and well, I'm on my first refill after the initial fill that came wow. out. And that's almost two years now. Wow. And I printed, oh boy, I think the last count was like 3000 pages in color, <laughs> something like that. Of course, you'd run more than one one sheet for the building you're working on. Like you'd run a whole bunch of sheets and you cut out some of them. That's what. Yeah, you exactly do. right. I use yeah. it for layering. Yeah. Uh, I almost always print two or three pages, the same page, two or three mm -hmm. copies. But I don't always use the same kind of paper. Oh sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I'll use a premium presentation paper, laminated over top. Of the other one. Uh, sometimes I will take the drawing and print it in mirror image mm -hmm. and use that as an inside layer and, and glue that to another print where I printed it the right way. That way you got inside and outside walls and your windows and everything are going to line up exactly because it's just the mirror it's image. Perfect. Yeah. And that helps with doing reinforcing layer, because then you know that it's going to fit. It's going to be the right size. You have to make a little bit of a cut on the edges to allow for material thickness, mm -hmm. but it'll it'll line everything up. Now, a third type of Epson paper that I've used occasionally is this, and this they give five stars on. This is their 
ultra premium presentation paper. <laughs> and this is 10.3 mil thickness. That's and it's Epson too, so it would work really well on your Epson printer. Yeah, yeah. I've tried all kinds of papers. And the thing I don't like about the, the coated paper, like this, a premium presentation mm -hmm. paper, is it does not glue especially well. Yeah. Uh, I, I use that Aline's tacky glue most of the time mm -hmm. for my assembly. And the presentation paper is coated. It has like a kale and clay or some sort of a coating on it to give it that nice uh, high finish and, mm -hmm. and good color reproduction. That doesn't the, work well with the glue. No, it doesn't because the glue won't, won't soak into it. And white glue basically depends on soaking into the paper fibers in order to, to stick. Exactly. Right. So it doesn't work real good for that. So for general construction, typically I use just regular good old cardstock. I don't know as I have any uh, open. I have open. But... Well, I'm gonna. That's all right. I'm gonna kind of move forward here a little bit. Right. So, but um, I, I do appreciate you showing what we're gonna be in for on uh, the Wednesday night build here on this. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more details on uh, uh, and information here because I picked up two or three good tips. Thanks, David. Just from that. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much, sir. No Appreciate it. Yep. All right. And Paul, thank you for uh, designing that structure. It's a good looking little structure. Um, okay. So at this point in time, folks, I have the um, door that I'm working on here real quick. I have gone through and taken a business card and in the background, just painted on a little bit of, um, uh, where am I at? Ching, 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 ching. Uh, this is nothing more than Reaper. Um, and uh, it's just a black and steel uh, acrylic paint by Reaper. Don't be afraid to, uh, Go to the fantasy guys and look at what those fantasy guys are using. You can get some strange oddball names. I don't care about the color of the name or the, the name of the paint. What I care about is the color, the hue, and the tinting aspect of those paints. So uh, what I'm saying here is don't hesitate to look at our friends over there in the fantasy world that are painting those fantasy figures because some of their paints like this are excellent for our uses. And what I've done here is just painted the corner of a business card. I'm gonna take a, um, a little piece of uh, my strip wood and I think this is the same width as uh, what this is here. Uh, let me flip this around. So you can see it's the same width. And I'm just gonna put it down up against uh, my side here, and I'm gonna make a, a real quick little cut, uh, keeping it all kind of uh, up against the square. I normally do this down below where I've got it, and let me put this up here a bit. I'm sorry, folks, I'm gonna to have to take this off just for a moment here as I do this. Get my thing back here real quick. Okay, so what I've done here is I've made the cut and you can see the cut there. And I'm just gonna cut this piece out, put that aside. I'm gonna take this little piece here. This is gonna be the back plate for my handle. Make sure that I've got the door situated the way that I want it. Um, so I've got the better coloring up below and um, the kind of weathered part at the bottom where the feet are. I'm gonna lay this down on here to kind of get a size of my handle. Um, 
Greg would say probably have that uh, figure standing by. I don't have a figure standing by. So I'm just going to grab my um, O scale ruler here real quick. And just for reference and make sure that I remember how big a, a foot is because that's roughly the length I'm going to make this thing. And so put it down on my ruler. I'm going to make it just slightly more, maybe closer to a foot and a half or so. So I'm right around that. All right. And I've cut that out. And now I've got those paper edges. So I'm going to take a uh, Prismacolor marker. Uh, where am I here? Ching, ching. Prismacolor. And this one's just the uh, eggplant. Um, and uh, it's uh, PM213 for those that want to know. And I'm going to use the fine tip. And I'm just going to, on the back side of this, you hopefully can see it in my fingertip. I'm just going to paint the back side. And that, in the process of painting the back side, because this is so small, it's also going to paint the edges of that paper. So I don't have any um, edge, you know, white edge. And if I see anything, I'm just going to touch it up. And it'll bleed over onto the front of the paper a little bit here and there, to act as a rust. And then I'm going to pull out my handy dandy Eileen's khaki. Boy, Eileen, we're doing a good ad for them today because everybody's using this stuff right now. And I'm going to pick that up with the tip of my hand. And I'm add just a, a bit of glue to the back side. Again, this is the side that I put the ink on. And then I'm going to add this to my door. And I'm going to make sure I've got it square. the door, put it in, scrape away any excess glue. Get rid of that piece. And then I'm going to press down on my base plate here. Okay, and make sure that it's square. It's something that's the same width. I find that I just take a, a pair of tweezers and kind of Squeeze the edges, it'll put it into place. And then I'm going to use a homemade tool. This is nothing more than a little, I think it's like a quarter inch, maybe half inch dowel, something like that. Uh, and I just took a straight pin, cut it off in half, uh, and stuck it into the end of it. I painted the uh, red stripe around it so that I don't stab myself with it. And I'm going to come in here and add a couple of uh, holes. And I'm just going to kind of force it, not all the way through the wood, but you know, fairly distance down into the wood. Try to get the holes as vertical as possible. And next step is to grab some O scale, um, or excuse me, HO scale uh, wire uh, to make my door handle with. And this is uh, a detail associates. It is 0.010 wire, which turns out to be about a half inch. And you probably can't see this at this point. So I'm going to just go on ahead and make it walk through the process. Just know that I've got the wire in here. I'm going to cut off a small piece of wire to begin with, with my wire nippers. And 
I'm going to shake that back down in there. And I've now got um, my piece of wire, and I'm going to take it and put it into my needle nose. Um, these are um, a flat edge. And I'm just going to take it and bend it so that I've got a good square bend. And then I'm going to do the same thing at the opposite end. And I'm going to measure roughly the distance to where that bend is and make a second bend. I don't know if I'm, I'm off of the thing here, but all I've done is just used my, my pliers here to get a, a straight bend. And um, so now I've got basically a miniature staple with long legs. And I'm going to grab my tweezers and make sure that this will fit in here okay. And I'm going to be okay. So now I'm going to take my tweezers. I'm going to hold this thing pretty flat um like this and i know you can't see the legs sticking out underneath pointing away from my eyes i'm going to cut this away and i've now got um something a little bit shorter the legs are still too long so i'm going to have to cut them down a little bit more i just know that from experience Get out my flat jaws here again. Oops. All right. Well, everybody kind of knows where this is going. Chris, any reason why you didn't take those holes clean through the door? Any why reason why what? Why you didn't take the holes clean through the door? Um, because in this case, it's thin enough and it's, I, I just am showing it. I didn't want to split the wood. Um, and quite honestly, normally I would kind of drill it. Um, but I don't, again, I'm trying to make this for newer modelers who don't have all of the tools. And, um, but you're absolutely right. It would probably be a lot easier to drill all the way through the door and then put a blob, blob of uh, uh, like epoxy or just bend the feet over uh, to seal it to the backside. Yeah, well, the other trick is uh, keep one leg longer than the other. If you do yeah. drill all, all the way through the door, uh -huh. uh, you then land one leg get it in the hole uh -huh. which sets you up so you've only got to line the second leg up to go in the other hole uh -huh. and then you can push it down to however depth you need and then you chop it off at the back yes yeah and normally I drill holes all the way through but um, just trying to introduce the folks to one way of doing it. And so I've got the, uh, you can't see it, I know, but I've got the handle in the holes at this point in time and it does fit. So I'm just gonna uh, kind of push it down a little bit and I'm gonna use the thickness of my, um, my tweezers here and pushing it across and do it the hand the handle came out and i'm going to grab my ca glue and i'm just gonna this is a thin ca 
And I'm going to throw a drop down on here. And then I'm going to just dip my handle in it and stick it in there. And I may have to do this offline, which I'll probably do so that we can move forward. Um, and with the door handle, let me put this aside because I think I'm going to do it offline. Um, but you guys know the process at this point in time. So anyway, that's kind of uh, how I build a, a door up and make the door handle and everything. Uh, I will then go back with just a little bit of uh, gold paint, uh, not brass, but gold, and uh, just kind of rub it across the top of the handle to give it a little bit of a sheen. The other thing you can do if you wanted to is you could, uh, before bending or just after bending it, you could always uh, stick that uh, little wire into a etching and blacken it if you wanted. Um, if you want to go to that depth and detail, but we're not doing that here. But um, after uh, adding the gold paint, it'll give you a little bit of different reflective uh, aspect to the handle. Uh, that is very subtle, but again, it is something that may kind of show up. Uh, then the next thing to do is to take my door throw it in into uh, position and I want it to go, let me move this handle real quick, please. I'm gonna put my handle aside in there. By the way, everything's going into my, my glass over here, I'm working tin. And um, I need to put this on. And lo and behold, guess what I did? I think I put the handle on the wrong side. Oops, nope. I do have it on the right side. I had the door upside down. Okay. So again, I've got the weathered at the bottom and then at the top. And I want just a slight opening at the bottom. So I'm going to come up to that second clapboard length. And then I'm going to take our. Uh, piece of uh, L girder that we made. And I'm going to glue that right across here, uh, extending across for the door. And that will hold that in place. And um, that's about it. And I'll do that offline. It's the same edge gluing technique that we used before. Again, just keeping the top part of that very clean. So, and that's it for today. Um, I'm going to do these couple of other steps offline so that we're ready to roll forward next week. Does anybody have any questions, comments, ideas, or anything? Uh, next week, I'll go through real quick, um, showing, uh, adding a few pastels to rust this up, and a few stains and a few tricks uh, using uh, uh, some brushes and uh, uh, a fan brush on making uh, some weathering streaks and stuff of that nature. Uh, questions, comments, thoughts? Anything on YouTube? No, not really. All there, right, was a, there was a couple okay. statements on there when uh, David Rarig was showing his uh, model, but they're really uh, just was Ken and he took care of it with the other guy. All right, super. Well, thank you, Ken. Thank you, everybody out there in YouTube land. And thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today on the Zoom call. And um, woo -hoo, let's go on ahead and uh, cut off the